everyone, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. My guest today is Dr. Rita Maria Lascalzo. Please welcome her to the show. You know, I've known about you for years. We travel in the same circles, even the same summits. I think I think we both were on perhaps Dr. Rick Dina's summit, but we've never met, so it's so nice to meet you. It's so nice to meet you too. I've seen you all over the place. Yeah, so. it's so funny. There's so many of us. And we that's what I love about doing this show. Because when I was just traveling, I would meet, you know, a few people a month, but I can meet so many more people. So I'd love, and my viewers would love to know about you, especially in terms of, you know, when did you become plant-based? Why? And what are you doing in this world? You know, one of the things I always tell people who want to know where I get my protein and you can't be plant-based for a long period of time, I say, oh, I haven't been doing it all that long, not only about 38 to 40 years. And they look at me like, oh, okay. Um, the nice ones say, oh, you don't even look old enough to have been doing it for 38 to 40 years. And then I, you know, gracefully thank them. But I started in my 20s. I grew up on Kool-Aid and M&Ms and Ronzoni and you know, lots of meat, but cheap meat because we didn't have a lot of money. And my health started falling apart in my 20s. Um, I would have, I never got much overweight because I was so vain that every time I started to gain weight from all the garbage I was eating, I would go on a crash diet, you know, the cabbage soup diet or the yogurt diet or whatever it might have been. But then my health really took a turn for the worse when I was in my 20s. And I started doing some research and after going to many, many doctors to try to figure out my gut and my not sinuses and surgeries and drugs, I finally, after getting told you don't have an ulcer, but keep taking the ulcer medication basically for the rest of your life, that I said, something's wrong with this picture. Could it be my diet? And the doctor said, oh, of course not. This was 40 years ago, right? Of course not. It can't be your diet. So I said, I'm defiant and I'm a rebellious person. I'm going to figure it out for myself. I found out it was my diet. I was toxic and I ended up doing ch diet changes, but also a fast. And I did fasting back in the day when it wasn't popular to do it. It was before Dr. Goldhammer even started his site, his, his fasting. And in fact, I met him shortly after I did my fast, he opened up his center and I went to visit him. Um, but I, I did a fast and it completely turned my health around. And I made the decision doing the fast was afterwards, I was just going to eat hundred percent plant-based whole foods pretty much for the rest of my life. And that's what I did. And so I never got those, those symptoms back. I started out hundred percent raw, realized I was eating too many dried fruits and nuts. And so I started to introduce some cooked food. I still am pr primarily raw, lots of salads and, you know, whole fresh plant foods. And in the winter time, I eat a lot of steamed vegetables and soups, you know, but I'm still tried and true. And this is what I've been doing for the last 40 years. That's and it completely amazing. turned me around while I was doing it. I was listening to lots of cassette tapes, I'm dating myself, cassette tapes of all kinds of natural hygiene ed educators talking about, so I'm like, wow, maybe I should quit my job and, you know, go back and become a doctor and do this for a living. And so that's what I did about a year after my fast, I quit my job and I went back to school and I got my chiropractic degrees and nutrition degrees and herbal medicine and heart math and acupuncture. And now I help people all over the world to regain their health, primarily through a whole foods plant-based diet. That's very, that's, a, that's really awesome. How did you know to fast? Like, did you do it on your own at home? How long did you do it for? Did you have any, did you go to a center? I know True North had not yet opened. It had not yet opened. So it's a funny story. I was sitting in the gas station, reading a nutrition book. My tires are being rotated or whatever. And a man, I call him the angel that saved my life came up to me and said, oh, you're interested in health. You're having some health issues. We had a conversation. He said to me, you need to fast. And I'd heard of fasting before because I'd read the five-day allergy relief book. And I said, yeah, I said, I did fast, but, and I felt great while I fasted. But as soon as I started eating, I felt like really bad again. And he goes, oh, you didn't fast long enough. I'm like, no, but I did it for five days. He goes, you didn't fast long enough. Gave me the card of a place down in Hollister, California and said, call these people and find out more. You need to fast. And then he was gone. And so I did, I contacted them. I went down and did one of their educational nights, learned about this and I was sold. 
and I signed myself in. That's amazing. I you 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 were you, before was you, you were fasting before fasting was cool. Oh, before fasting was popular. So people who say I have five years of experience teaching people how to fast, I'm like, okay, <laughs> I have forty years experience. How long did you fast for? Okay, you ready? Oh my god! It's if you say scary. forty, if you say no, forty days, I'm not going to. Twenty eight. Twenty eight. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Incredible. I only made it four when I went to True North. I'm going to maybe try again sometime. That, okay. and, and, and when did you change your diet for, you know, for good? It was the fast that did it because the night before I was going to fast, I decided I needed to eat all my favorite foods for the last time. And I'd been off and on them, you know, for a year. What were your favorite foods before the fast? Ice cream. Mm. Um, one was... One was, and I, I was really disappointed by it. I hadn't had it for a year, but it was basically toast with mozzarella cheese melted on top. And I made it and I was like, mangoes taste better than this. You know, I, so I was disappointed. Ice cream eh, it was a good one. And then that was it. Cause I knew I'm a determined person. And when I make a decision, I stick with the decision. And I decided after reading all the research and listening, I'm like, this is it. Whole foods, plant-based. We, that wasn't even a term back then. Yeah. yeah, that that's that's. Yeah. And where where did you grow up? I grew up in New York in in Astoria, Queens. You know, pizza, Greek food, cannolis. You know, you know, it's so that. interesting because I you I'm, I'm I you don't have to say your age. I'm guessing we're maybe in the same area because I've been vegan for almost forty seven years, and it, it's interesting because we didn't have like the the you know the gurus to look up to then because we didn't have an internet. And even though Dr. Goldhammer and Dr. McDougall, you know, and Dr. Campbell, Dr. Essels, they were all alive. I I never heard of them when I was seventeen. You know, no, we didn't have the yeah. And I was I was thirty when I made the change, so you can do your math. Um, wow. well, if that's true, then you look amazing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not that great at math, but you do look really, you look great. That's that. So how do you work with people? Is it like through group programs? Is it one-on-one? -on -one? Cause you, you mentioned a lot of different modalities. Like you're an herbalist, you're an, cause acupuncture, you probably can't do virtually. Virtually. No, I don't do that anymore virtually except on my family, but, um, I work with people virtually and I've been doing that long before the pandemic. I started doing that in 2010 or 11 and I did my first online programs then. Um, I do group programs where there's education, recipes, et cetera, and then live sessions, mostly with me, but I have some practitioners I've trained. I also train health practitioners. So I help train health practitioners in what I call nutritional endocrinology. How do you control the hormones in the body, which hormones control everything, by the way, um, to help people to get well using food um, and nutrition. And, you know, we're not adverse to supplementation, but it's kind of a food first approach and um, lab testing to see where their imbalances are. So we do a lot of that. And um, yeah, we do group programs. I do some one-on-one, -on -one, but mostly within the context of a group program. And I have coaches I've trained who do one-on-ones in our in our group, in our organization. Nice. It's funny you mentioned hormonal health because I do remember seeing an interview with you because I I, I, I watched the whole, I think it's called the Whole Life Action Hour through Food Revolution. And oh, yeah, you yeah. an interview with yeah, Ocean Robbins and it was specifically about hormonal health. So is that kind of your, your niche or your specialty? Kind of. I mean, you know, I had to, I could, like anybody else, I can say I can help anybody with anything, but I believe that hormones control everything. So in the guise of that and metabolic health, which is a completely misunderstood and overlooked area, which is, you know, the balance of blood sugar, insulin, how that interacts with thyroid. So I would say my specialty is metabolic health. Meta well, what is metabolic health? How would yeah. you explain it? Metabolic health is really, you know, all the things that in the body that take the outside and make it, make it the inside, make it you, right? So how do you process your foods? How do you take the sugars that are in the foods and get them into the bloodstream and get them into the cells, into the mitochondria so we can make energy and then process that so everything else works properly. So there are some studies recently that uh, showed that 93% of the population, this was back in 2021, um, that 93% of the population is what's considered metabolically unwell. 
That means only 7% are metabolically well. And the guidelines they used to determine that were waist hip ratio or waist size, uh, fasting glucose, insulin levels, or hemoglobin A1C, not insulin, because most of them don't even measure that. And when they took those measures, 93% of the pe people didn't even meet the basics for where I consider as like barely, barely healthy. So it's sad. And so we need to do something about it, right? We need to do something about it. And the biggest problem is food. You yeah. know, stress is a biggie. And we've had a lot of stress over the last few years and pandemic and shutdowns and all this. Lack of sleep is a big part of it. But what people are putting in their mouth, it's not a drug, a wonder drug that now we're seeing a lot of out there and they're finding lots of side effects from the wonder drugs. It's not a wonder drug deficiency. It's the lack of real good food. Yeah. You know, I think a lot of times when people, especially non-medical people hear the word hormones, they think like naturally or automatically like female hormones. But I think a lot of people don't realize that insulin is actually a hormone. Yeah, there are hundreds of hormones. The digestive system is controlled by hormones. There's about 28 hormones that I know about that control digestion. The heart, there's cardiac hormones. There's hormones that affect the kidneys. Insulin is a major, and there's what I, I differentiate between the everyday hormones, the most, you know, things that are going to keep us good, healthy every day, and the bedroom hormones, the sex hormones. And most people go right there. They go, you know, oh, my estrogen's okay. I'm not, my hormones are fine. But no, that's not true, right? Estrogen is controlled in a lot of ways from insulin. So insulin's a biggie. Um, thyroid hormones are biggie. The adrenal hormones are big. Um, these are all hormones that I call the everyday hormones. In fact, I have a, like a seven week program that takes you through those, those everyday hormones and helps people get them balanced using food and, and lifestyle. Yeah. How, how do you, because especially cause you're working virtually, do you do any kind of tests or, or, or is there a way to test somebody's hormones? Absolutely. Absolutely. We test hormones all the time. Um, the beauty of it these days is in most states in the U.S., you can actually order a test, not through a doctor. You can just order it yourself and go into the lab and get it tested. New York doesn't allow it. A few other states don't allow that. You have to get it um, prescribed. But basically, you go in, they take the sheet in, they get their blood drawn. That's for blood tests. But there's a lot of other tests that test the functioning of the body. So there's stool tests, there's um, uh, urine tests for hormones, especially hormones. You can test in the urine, you can test in the saliva. So there's all sorts of tests. And we just need to order test kits for people and they get the test kits and they do it. Or we send them to some place where they can order it themselves. Usually when people come to you, what is their number one uh, concern or problem that leads them to seek consult with you? I would say the majority of them are exhausted. <laughs> I think everybody is though. I mean, even people <laughs> who sometimes without hormonal problems, it seems like the world has gotten very exhausting, but, but they, yeah, that's interesting. So a fatigue, maybe fatigue. Yeah. Brain fog is a biggie. Um, just, you know, the weight, the extra weight that they can't get rid of. That's a hormonal problem. And people don't realize that that it's not like you're just your thyroid. Insulin is a huge component and constituent in excess weight that won't release. Yeah. So with that, you've written a lot of books on this subject, I believe. <laughs> I have. Um, mostly just ebooks. I haven't even taken the time and the energy to get them published and all that. A few of them are published. Unstoppable Health is one um, that I writ wrote, and it's basically a fiction, but nonfiction. So it's basically a story of a person on her quest to get through this maze of, of health challenges and how she gets to the other side. It's a, it's a fun book and it's called Unstoppable Health. And you can get that on Amazon. You know, it's interesting because I, 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 this was, this had to be I'm not kidding, like 20 years ago that I bought an, an ebook and ebooks weren't as popular back then that you co-wrote with another lady that has been on my show, Karen Osborne. And I just remember it was like delicious. I think it might've been raw, oil-free desserts. Am That's I it. Yep. They were all raw and they were all oil-free and sugar-free. There was no, no agave or maple syrup or honey or any of that. There were dates in, in many of them or raisins or other kinds of whole food sweeteners. But yeah, um, that was back. Wow. 
It's actually a physical book and you can get it on Amazon. Um, Tell me about it and let's put it in the show notes because I just yeah. remember it was wonderful. What, what is it called? It's called Dessert, Making It Rich Without Oil. Nice. And it's available on Amazon. You can get it as an ebook. You can get it as a Kindle book or you can get it as a physical book. A lot of recipe books I like to get physical because I like to have them on my counter um, to do it. And there's beautiful pictures in there that Karen took of all the food we we put together. I remember, it's so funny. I remember that book and I'm sure I made some recipes for it. Maybe I'll have to get the physical version because I have no idea, you know, all these years where the heck I would. Where it might be. Where, where, where the heck? Yeah, well, I'll, send you a, uh, I'll send you the ebook again. So you don't have to but I remember it was beautiful. The photography was beautiful and the recipes were just the way I eat. You know, the oil thing is so, uh, you know, I, I, I don't work with people individually or anymore sometimes in groups but you know the oil is just so insidious in our diet and i feel like that if if people under really really understood how it affected their health their metabolic health and their weight it, it would it would help them immensely but there's still so many doctors even some of the plant-based doctors that are cardiologists that are touting the health benefits of oil and even if there were a health benefit i always say if, if there's something magical that you need in the olive oil why wouldn't it be in the olive like it doesn't is. <laughs> yeah, they don't get rid of it. So, you know, and that's the thing. I mean, if you want to eat nuts and seeds and avocado, you know, all that's good. But why would you want to eat the processed version why the oil? of fiber and nutrients are stripped? And even so it's, I mean, oil, I mean, there's more calories in a tablespoon of oil than in a pound of, of, of many fruits or in two pounds of vegetables. But I think people think they need it for brain health or, or I don't know why they think they need it. And from a culinary standpoint, we both know that you can certainly make food. But you can delicious. do it without it. You can make the dessert great without it. Exactly. You know, it's an interesting topic because we, we tout the benefits of whole food, right? Whole food, plant-based diet. A plant-based diet is not inherently healthy. It's a whole foods, high vegetable plant-based diet with the right amount of good fats. And we tout this, but it's just like, I always say, it's just like white flour. It's just like a refined grain. You don't, it's it's stripped of a lot of its nutrition. So I don't eat, I don't like olive oil. I like olives. I don't like coconut oil. I like coconut, you know, uh, macadamia nuts and cashews and and hopefully I like them sprouted, raw sprouted, and we dehydrate them for, for longevity. But those are the foods that still have intact all the protein, all the calcium, you know, all of those nutrients that are in there. Yeah. And, you know, and, and the thing is, people say, well, it tastes good. And I don't believe it tastes good by itself. It tastes good when you put a lot of salt with it, you know, but, but just, I mean, do you know anybody that just like drinks oil? I know people dip bread in it, but it's again, because then you have the refined carbohydrate and, but it's just, it's such, it's such, so curious to me why people think they need it and why they say it tastes so good because by itself, it really doesn't. It really doesn't. Right. It really doesn't. I remember doing when I first changed my diet and I was like craving a cracker right? And I'm like, oh, this cracker is so good. And it was a whole grain cracker. And I'm like, wait a minute, is it really good or is it addictive? So I sat it side by side. I sliced up some mango and I ate one and then the other. And I said, which one honestly tastes good? And of course it was the mango that tasted way better than this cracker, but it was the, the salty allure that you get from a cracker. I'm not against salt. I think a lot of people really do need it. I limit it and people eat too much of it, but I, um, I don't think people need oil. And there, uh, let me take that back. There are some times when I have someone who I'm working with who really has some digestive imbalances and they can't eat enough food to get a specific type of fat that they need, that I've identified they need, that I'll recommend that. Or somebody who's just keeps losing weight. You see those people on a plant-based diet just because they haven't trained themselves to be able to eat all the fiber, to eat all the goodness in there. And so we might put some oil in there to keep them from, you know, going down to nothing. You know, it, it was interesting. I had an experience recently. I mean, I, I don't have any in the house, 
I don't eat it. And I can't, I mean, I went, when I heard Dr. Esselstyn once give a lecture in Los Angeles and it was just really about how to become heart attack proof. And, and I, I was still overweight at the time, but it just made so much sense. You know, that's when I stopped eating oil, which was, I remember August 1st, 2008. And so the hardest thing of course, is other people's houses and restaurants, um, if, you know, to completely avoid things, but we, we produce conferences up here in the Sacramento area, my husband and I. And so we had to do a test meal at this place. And, you know, I told him the restrictions and stuff stuff like that. But it, it's like, so I, I had, it was just broccoli, right? And, and but it, there was steamed broccoli. And I guess I had accidentally taken a few florets of the one with oil and salt. And it's, it's like, when you have the oil and salt together, it's like, this actually tastes pretty good. And it was like, you know, I, I mean, I didn't want to put the four, 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 four florets back. So I ate them, but then I ate the steamed and it was like, oh gosh, there really is a difference. And so I can see when people are changing their diet, if they're right. used to eating a lot of oil and salt, how at first having it the way we recommend might be less satisfying. Less satisfying. But there's all kinds of great sauces you can make with whole foods. And I always include vegetables in making like a sauce or a salad dressing. So I'll put a cucumber and a tomato and then, you know, and I don't put oil in those, I may put a handful of, of some sort of nuts or seeds. I might put in an avocado or whatever. And it makes this really creamy, like tahini is an example. Love tahini, sesame butter. You just put a few tablespoons of that in there and you season it up. I love it with ginger and turmeric and cayenne. And you put that over your veggies. and like, that's a, a meal fit for a king. Absolutely. I, I feel like it's more the addictive quality of food that gets people to make, make their choices often rather than the health qualities. Absolutely. And that's what I found when I compared the mango with the, the cracker. I wanted more of the cracker, but the mango tasted when I purely let it sit on my tongue, the mango tasted better, but it's not addictive. It's just like, oh, I had enough mango. I'm done. Move on. You know, that, that's the thing that, you know, and like you said, you, we were mentioning people that don't maybe are losing weight, you have to, a lot of people don't understand that if they're eating without all these high fat things like oil, they have to eat more food, it, you know, yeah. and, and, and that's what I love about the plant-based diet. Cause I like eating larger quantities of food and I never have to worry about it with whole foods without oil, you know, fruits, vegetables, right. any of those whole grains and legumes, because it's like you're your body stops. Whereas like with, with crackers, I, and I know that because sometimes I eat chips, not, not chips, chips, but like, you know, I'll take corn tortillas made out of corn. Then if I'm eating those um, and make them into those little baked chips, it's like, I can eat way more than I can if I eat corn, for example. Yeah. 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 Well, corn right off the cob that, you know, there's just, you stop after half or one ear. You know? Exactly. Yeah. So Dr. Rita Marie, why do you think a plant-based diet is so valuable for restoring metabolic health in people? So if you were to look out and you were to look at all the books on um, insulin resistance, leptin resistance, blood sugar balance, they're all animal-based, right? And people are eating a lot of animal products and skipping the sugars, which they need to, skipping some of the refined grains, which they need to. But they're still, they're inflammatory. I mean, there's fats in the meats that are inflammatory. And a lot of people are looking to restore metabolic health and they just eliminate the carbs and they don't think about the quality of the rest of the food. So whole, plant-based, whole foods, plant-based with lots of veggies, lots of greens, lots of rainbow veggies, that's going to help the body to maintain balance. A lot of those books will eliminate the veggies, like the keto, a lot of the keto books, they eliminate veggies because they have too many carbs. What they're not looking at is net carbs versus total carbs, fiber, which most people are deficient in, and how they affect. So when you eat plants, you're getting phytochemicals that help to balance the way the body handles glucose and insulin. You get lots of magnesium. Magnesium is needed for the insulin receptors to accept the insulin attached to the sugar and fuel the cell. Magnesium is deficient big time in our modern diets because there's lack of plants, green leafy vegetables loaded with magnesium. So it's loaded with nutrients. It's low on the toxicity scale, assuming it's whole foods, low on the toxicity scale. And assuming if you're doing whole foods plant-based, you're not eating hydrogenated oils. You're not eating these 
free radical uh, inducing uh, fats that are going to throw your body off and inflammation and inflammation is so critical or lack of inflammation is so critical for good metabolic health. Now that said, it doesn't mean that there's one size fits all plant-based diet that suits everyone because of like for me, genetics and early exposure to lots of M&Ms and, and Kool-Aid has thrown my mechanisms off to the point where I have to carefully choose my foods and I have to eat lots and lots of greens and broccoli and cauliflower and colorful vegetables, minimal amounts of fruit, not that I don't eat it, but I eat it with my greens to slow down the absor absorption of the sugars. And some grains I can handle like wild rice and brown rice I can't because it shoots my sugar up. So it's a matter of figuring out what works best for you. Like lentils work for me, but certain like black beans don't work for me. They make my blood sugar go too high. So I work with people to help them figure out which of these good plant foods they can eat. We do a 30 day reset. So they avoid all the ones that make their sugars go up. And then we introduce them. I have a very tailored approach to reintroducing to see. And for me personally, before I did my own reset, I love pineapple. I love, 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 love pineapple. But pineapple shot my sugar up to 167. I'm like, oh, so I haven't figured out how much pineapple I can eat and what I have to eat it with to keep my blood sugar steady. And that's what I advocate for people to keep their blood sugar steady. Because so many people are running around with pre-diabetes and they're not even told they do. And they just keep going until they get diagnosed. And then what, right? Now they have a disease that, can take them down if they're not careful. There's a condition before it's medically diagnosable, I call it pre-insulin resistance. And that's when certain foods are causing your sugars to go way up, come back down either slowly or rapidly, uh, either way there's dangers, and it's not being recognized because your baseline fasting glucose goes back to normal in the morning when the doctor tests it. And it's only when it's been going on like that for decades that they'll diagnose a person with diabetes. I believe in helping people to understand if they're on that road, how do they adapt their diet? And the starting point is eat more plants, right? Get rid of the refined foods and then figure out what of the good whole foods you might have to be a little bit more careful. When you say your your blood sugar, like pineapple made your blood sugar go up, were you were you using like a continuous glucose monitor? How were you testing this? Back in the day, before continuous glucose monitors were available to the public, I used a, a glucometer. And I started testing my own when I was hosting a class. I mean, 100 people signed up for a blood sugar balancing nine week or 12 week, whatever program. And everybody was asked to get a glucose meter. So I was making a video about how to use it. And I accidentally discovered how high my sugar went with fruits. So that's what I use then. Now I use a continuous glucose meter and I use it continuously because it keeps me on track. And if I want to test a new food, I'm in a country that has amazing fruits right now. And I want to see how does that fruit, whatever it might be called, I don't even know if I can pronounce it. How does that affect my glucose? So I have my glucose meter on and I test it. So I've been using personally and recommending to clients for probably five or six years. I can't remember when they first came out uh, to the public. And that's when, that's what I've been doing. So yeah, and I highly recommend that everybody gets a glucose meter and then just does a month trial to figure out what things are causing it to go up. It's not always the food though. And that's the thing. You get stressed out. You start yelling at people. You get all bent out of shape because you're watching the news. I had somebody yesterday just told me that because yeah, there are certain foods that are raising it. I get it, but it's more likely to be stress that gets me going. Nice. Yeah. What and lack of sleep? Yeah. Well, lack. Of, well, yeah. You can talk about that. That's the cause of a lot of problems. Oh, that's the cause of so many problems. And lack of sleep will cause insulin resistance and even a healthy person the day after they have lack of sleep. So if you don't sleep for whatever reason, you have a screaming child, a sick parent, whatever you're tending to, and you don't get enough sleep, 
be super careful about what you eat the next day because you're going to have more of an insulin resistance response. You get back on track, it'll reverse itself. But chronically, over time, it becomes a big issue. Big issue. Yeah. Yep. What problems have you seen your clients or patients encounter when transitioning to plant-based diet in general or specifically when it comes to their metabolic health? Yeah, um, so many. Um, people who are used to eating standard American diet, lots of meat, processed foods, first of all, they are talking about, I can't get full. I don't feel satiated. I'm not getting enough calories. And indeed, they're not used to eating volume. They're used to eating a little bit, which is very dense in calories. And now they have to eat more. So some of them that don't want to lose weight, lose weight. And we have to caution them on how to add the extra calories back in. Sometimes they get a little bit of um, indigestion, like bloating gas, because their, their gut flora is not used to all of these phytochemicals and fibers and things that, you know, shift the ecology around a lot. Um, if they do it too rapidly, some people have detox symptoms. They'll have headaches and achiness in their body. So I'm really cautious with people, usually try to get them to go slowly, you know, and move and get rid of the most, uh, well, actually I use ads first. I like to use ad first and say, okay, I want you to add a plate of steamed broccoli every day. Let's just add that. And it, it displaces some of the other stuff. And then we gradually add some stuff and then take away some stuff. Some people it's overnight. That's amazing. So you promote a diet that is completely free of processed oil and I believe sugar as well. Yes. So, and me too. And, and I, I, you know, I, I'm not that strict on salt. I just, I don't add it, but I eat there. It's in things. So with that diet, what do you eat in a day? Cause our viewers love to know what our guests, especially those that look great eat. I usually start my day with 32 ounce green smoothie and it's green, no fruit. There's some avocado in there to make it all blend together. Or sometimes hemp seeds or something else, but usually avocado and spices like ginger and turmeric and a lot of the anti-inflammatory stuff. And it tastes really good. Lots of lemon or lime. Um, I start my day with that. And I do with that, like a coconut yogurt, sometimes a cashew or other kind of plant-based yogurt, but my favorite is coconut yogurt. And I have that, like today I had that with some tropical fruit. I had the, and I do it all together. So I'm sipping the smoothie and eating the fruit. I find if I blend the fruit into the smoothie, my sugar will go up. But if I eat them separately side by side, as long as I'm not overdoing the fruit, my sugar stays perfectly fine. So um, a bowl of, you know, maybe some berries, you know, at home, it would more likely be berries here in the tropics. Um, you know, there's some pineapple and mango and papaya with the coconut yogurt, added some hemp seeds, a few sprouted um, walnuts. What else did I put on that? That was a typical, you know, or I'll have just a salad. I'll have the green smoothie. And then if we have a salad left over from the night before that I couldn't finish, I'll have the salad with it. Um, and, you know, dinner is generally, you know, either a stir fry or steamed vegetables or a soup or just a big giant salad with everything under the sun on it and a tahini dressing. Um, I make desserts. I don't make them all the time, but I make really good whole foods, plant-based desserts. Um, I do have a, a chocolate. Uh, I love chocolate, but I get hundred percent cacao and do something with it and mix it with you know, I made a really good treat a couple of weeks ago. I took cauliflower flour. I don't know if you've seen that. It's relatively new on the Wait, market. Cauliflower. Okay. No, I haven't. I've seen banana flour, but I have not seen cauliflower, cauliflower flour. So I, I had banana flour, green banana flour and cauliflower flour. And I mixed it in and I put, I don't, I, mean, I put some chocolate powder and some nuts and seeds, you know, probably some pumpkin seeds and walnuts and whatever else, put it all in the food processor, added a little bit of monk fruit sweetener to sweeten it and um, blended it all up and made them into little fudge balls. And it was quite good. I think I made a video. It might be on my Facebook. I don't know how to find things on Facebook once yeah. you make I know that's what that's what I love about YouTube. That I've never I've never heard. I'm going to check it out for sure. Where did, you, where did you find the cauliflower flour? Um, 
I think I found it on Amazon. It was, what company is it? Navitas, Navitas Naturals. That and I just happened to, you know, they say you based on what you like, you may also like, and I'm like, cauliflower, flower, what a great idea, right? For creating recipes, creating, you know, uh, various veggie kind of burgers. And there's so many options for it. Yeah. That's, you had mentioned to me before uh, we started the show that you are thinking, or maybe have already written a book based on cauliflower. And you mentioned something that intrigued me, a cauliflower bagel. Yeah, 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 yeah. And so I collected all my recipes for that I've done with cauliflower and I'm like, I'm going to make an ebook. I haven't done it yet, but it's, it's packaged. It's just not prettified yet, but uh, cauliflower bagels. So food processor, you throw in cauliflower, zucchini, zucchini gives things a really beautiful creaminess. Um, and then some nuts and seeds, whatever it could be flax seeds, chia seeds, hemp seeds, uh, walnuts, any kind of nuts or seeds to hold it as uh, hold it together and you grind it all up. I mean, I have a specific recipe that I can give you the link to so people can actually download the actual recipe. Yes, that, that sounds amazing. I, I, yeah. make, I make a, a bagel out of potato. And it, but it looks and tastes exactly like a bagel. Really? So yeah, it's, I do it. I, I'm one of the culinary instructors for Dr. McDougall's online program. And, you know, he's all about the potato yeah. and starch and, and, and the recipes free in, on my YouTube channel. It's also in the book. So what I do is I take a Yukon gold potato. And the reason I'm choosing them is they work better. And also they tend to be round. So you can actually purchase them like you look, which one looks most like a bagel. And then I, you can cook them, steam them, microwave, however, and then you chill them. And then I have this little tool that I use to get the seeds out of the cucumber. And then I make a little hole and then I cut it in half. And so the side without the skin, I dip in something called everything but the bagel seasoning, which you can oh, get. I've seen that. Yeah, yeah. And you can get it salt-free or not salt-free. And then I put it either in the oven or the air fryer. And I'm telling you, they look exactly like a bagel. They <laughs> taste like a toasted bagel. And so for well, people who have that bread craving, it's just, you know, yeah, basically one exactly ingredient. Exactly. So that's yeah. very cool. Very yeah. Mine is more than one ingredient. And then you have to take it and you shape it. But I did find this really cool little mold on Amazon that you can put it in and shape it into a bagel shape. And then I put them in the dehydrator. I suppose you could also bake them if you wanted to, if you don't have a dehydrator, it does yeah. low temperature, but I dehydrate them overnight and they come out amazing. Yeah. I love my dehydrator. And I, I, you know, people always, every time, and I, I try not to just do only dehydrated recipes, but I have a few in all my books and go, well, can I do it in the oven? And, and, you know, I've never seen dehydrated recipes come out quite the same, even in a yeah. conviction oven. I mean, and, and, you know, I just, I love my Excalibur. I love it too. <laughs> Yeah. Did you ever go to Living Light? You know, I, I graduated from Living Light over like 21 years ago. So I'm guessing you might know some of those people that were involved with that school. Well, I've never been to any culinary school. I just decided to make stuff on my own. But I know Sherry Sawyer very well. In fact, we visited her just a couple of weeks ago here. Yeah, in she's, 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 she's wonderful. Yeah, very creative. Very Karen wonderful. Osborne's been there and Alicia Ojeda. So we probably yeah. know. I know folks. Alicia. Actually, I think I'm not going to see her. Actually, I'm doing an event in New York. Yeah, that, that that's that's. She me. and I did a book together called Driving God to Heaven. And it's all our favorite dehydrator treats like the the stuff that, you know, you crave and you go, oh, I can't. I'm, I'm, I mean, I know you're a doctor and help people, but man, I'm interested in your cookbooks. Those That sounds like a great book. Why do I? She's been on the show. Why is nobody mentioning that book to me? Yeah, I think it's a great book. And I don't, um, I just make things and I don't do a good job of marketing them. So that's something we're going to do. We're going to create a, a storefront on our website that has all those books that people can just go and buy the individual books. They're now part of our programs. But I love the food piece because I feel like when you just tell somebody, stop eating this, start eating that, they don't know what to do. They need the instructions. So we do a monthly show within our membership online where I'm in the kitchen or I have a guest coming in. We should have you on. You should come if you want to do that. that yeah, I mean, awesome. I could probably, I mean, I mean, the only thing about dehydrated recipes is it, you have to have like a, another one already ready. But, oh, yeah. but no, but you don't have to do dehydrated. I'm just saying, sure. Honor. Oh, yeah. I'll be happy to. But when you know, I, I feel like, you know, even my husband was saying the other day, pe uh, not everybody, you know, obviously people have dental problems, but I think in general, because you had mentioned the cracker. And while, yes, it may be more addictive or have qualities that the mango didn't, I think that, that a lot of humans like crunch. And I feel that when you make a food in a dehydrator, the crunch is unparalleled, even more than if you fry it, you know? Yep. 
Yep. I love it. I love it. And it lasts so long. That's a cool thing. I, I, I I remember one time I used to make this and I still do. I make a lot of, a lot of raw things and, or sometimes they have oats, which I found that you can actually get some raw oats now, but I make a lot of granolas because especially for travel. And I had sent some to this lady that had a health food store in Big Bear to see if she wanted to carry it. This was like 20 years ago. And I didn't realize it. Like you have to use a different kind of address in Big Bear. Anyway, it came back to me like in nine months, undeliverable. And I'm like, it was still good. It was good. Fine. It was like it was fine. You can't really yeah. say that about a lot of things. It's so many things. And you know, with the dehydrator, and the, like you said, I don't eat dehydrated. That's not my mainstay. But you need it. And traveling, right? If I want to travel and I want to be able to take vegetables along. I can make them into a cracker. I can make kale crisps. I can make, I have sauerkraut crackers that I make. I love it's, sauerkraut. That's like probiotic foods are hard to travel with, right? But you can do it. I even, this was something that came to me. I'm like, I'm going to Costa Rica. I have no idea what kind of food they're going to have there, but I know they're not going to have my coconut yogurt. So I took my coconut yogurt and I put it on dehydrator trays in tortilla type shapes. Um, and I made, I just said, I don't know what's going to happen, but I'm going to try it. Oh my God. They were so amazing. They, that was it. All it was, was the coconut yogurt and all the coconut was coconut yogurt was, was coconut and water and probiotics. And that it's very amazing. cool. You know, a lot of times if I'm making, and especially cause I'm, you know, have a new cookbook coming out. Like if I have extra of something, like let's say it didn't fit in whatever it was going to go in, like the, the, the tray or the pan. I'll just, just out of curiosity, put it in a dehydrator and, and it's like another recipe, you know? Exactly. I call it the, I call it the leftovers cracker or the leftovers, you know, whatever. And I've done that when I've done classes and, you know, you do a class, you have a little bit of this soaked and you have this chopped and you didn't use it all. So I'm like, what if I throw it all in the food processor, grind it up and stick it in the dehydrator. And it tasted so good. I didn't even have to add seasonings to it. And I have you know, a clean out the fridge cracker. I love that. I do the same thing, dehydrator or air fryer. Yeah. When it comes to metabolic health, when in health in general, like a weird, what about exercise? Do, does that improve one's metabolic health if yes. someone's willing to move yes. their body a bit? Trained muscles are way more insulin sensitive than untrained muscles. So I'm a big fan of exercise to your capacity. There's no one size fits all exercise plan. I really love burst exercise where you do 30 seconds of all out and then you rest, um, but exercise is critical, but you don't want to over-exercise. So I always tell people, because I do get people who over-exercise and then they, they're exhausted for two days. If you exercise on Monday and you're still tired by Wednesday or Thursday and you can't go back and exercise again, you overdid it. You should be able to get up the next day and do it again. Now, granted, if you just ran 20 miles, you're not going to get up the next day and do it again. But if you're overdoing it, you're not going to feel good after exercise and you should feel good after exercise. Yeah, absolutely. I find like with me, if I don't exercise first thing in the morning, it just doesn't get done. It's hard. I did that the other day. I couldn't do it first thing. So first day in the last three months that I didn't get up in the first thing in the morning and it was like dragging myself It's five o'clock. I better go out and do it now. <laughs> It's, it's, I don't know what it is, but it's like the same thing with making the bed. It's like, if you don't make the bed two o'clock, it's unmade. You're not going to make it because you figure, well, I'm going to be in it in a few hours. So yeah. it's really, it's, it's so interesting. Yeah. yeah. I didn't exercise for most of my life, but n n when I, once I started, then I, it just, it became a habit and it's just, yeah. you know, I mean, I, if there was a way I could have health and pay somebody to exercise for me, I would, but I am I really. Yeah, I mean, love you love it. Well, what do you tell me okay. how you love it? And what do you do that you love? I it? love running. And oh, wow. I love, love running and people say, well, you shouldn't be running all the time. Vary it. I don't want to vary it. I don't, I don't go, I'm going to go running. I really love it. And I like listening to books on tape, you know, audibles. So it drives me to, oh, I'm going to go a little longer. I love weightlifting. I honestly love weightlifting, you know, let's bring it on, make me sweat, make me hurt, you know, but it doesn't hurt. I don't do it to a point of hurt. I, I love what else I love hiking. Yeah. Right? Bicycling, I like, I haven't done it in a long time, but I do, once I get into it, I really like it and I love swimming. So yeah, I love moving my body. Right. When you became plant vegan or plant-based, uh, which was, you were saying about 40 years ago, 
were you able to influence any friends or family members at that time or or maybe since because now they've seen you stick with it so long and how you're in good health and look good has anybody changed their diet because of you other than you know clients and stuff? other than clients right um not at the beginning they thought i was crazy they thought i was anorexic because i had fasted um and they just thought it was weird that I'd go to family gatherings and wouldn't eat the food, right? But over time, periodically, one or more of my relatives or friends would reach out and say, I'm having this health issue. Can you help me? Right. And they'll do some things, you know, not all of it. They still think I'm a little wacky. But um, yeah, so it's really hard to influence your friends and family. And you have to wait for them to ask. Because if you try to tell them what they should do and they haven't asked, you lose them. I agree. It's much easier to influence a stranger than it is a, a loved one. <laughs> I've literally at the airport, sat at the airport, pulled out a nori sheet to eat and had somebody go, wow, what is that? What is it? And I explain it to them. They go, that's interesting. I'm like, I have more. Do you want to try it? And they've literally tried and said, oh, I'm going to have to buy those. So my family members would just look at me like M&Ms. I want M&Ms. I don't want nori sheets, you know? That is, that is so funny. So a lot of your books are actually on the topic of hormonal health. I believe you have one called hormonal yep. balancing or hormone balancing, hormonal hacking. Yep. I have, and then those are eBooks and those are available for free. So um, I'll give you the, I'll actually give you the links. You can. Oh, wow. Them. That's so nice of you. you so yeah, definitely it. anything yeah. you want, just me. Yeah. The There's one know. that's plant powered hormone balancing. And I actually go through for different hormones. Like what are some of the foods and herbs that help to bring them into balance? Um, that's not a recipe book. The hormone hacking breakfast is how do you, how do you put together a breakfast? Whether you are somebody who eats breakfast at noon or eats breakfast at eight o'clock, it doesn't matter. How do you set yourself up for hormonal balance and metabolic health throughout the day? And it's called hormone hacking, uh, hormone hacking breakfast men menu, something like that. Yeah. So we have quite a number of them. And I do have that bagel. I'll give you the link to the bagel recipe. That is so nice of you. Thank you. Where do you, other than, you know, in your private programs and with a uh, your membership group and people that you work with, where, is there a place you hang out? Like, like I hang out on YouTube every day. Is there a place that people can follow you or find you if they want more? Yeah, information? I'm on Facebook a lot. I'm, I'm going to, I started to do YouTube once a week and then I dropped back. And so I'm going to be starting that again. Cause I really like that because you can find things. If I do a video that's a Facebook live and I want to find it three months later, good luck. I can't find it. Right. So I really want to get back on YouTube, but I do have a YouTube channel. Um, we have over 5,000 people, which is a drop in the bucket compared to what you have. But um, we have the YouTube channel and a lot of recipes. My older ones get more views. I have making making green smoothies and a lot of in the kitchen stuff. But I'm more on Facebook than anything else. I haven't figured out Instagram. I just haven't. Yeah, that's, 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 for the, that's for the young folk. I don't get Instagram maybe. either or TikTok, I think. I don't know. I've been that figured out. I have a few things. I definitely have a presence there, but mainly the, the Instagram is because if I do something on YouTube, it gets posted. Yep. Same thing. Multi-streaming. Yeah. How do you feel about a hundred percent raw diet? Do you think it's healthy and even sustainable for most people? I think that, I mean, I did it for a while. Um, I think it depends on the person and where they're coming from. And I've seen it as a phenomenal therapeutic transition type diet. So I did my fast. I was hundred percent raw for probably three or four months. Um, and then I, you know, dabbled mostly do raw foods. Is it sustainable? It's challenging. If you're traveling, if you're going to people's house, it's easy to say, okay, I'll have your steamed vegetables, right? I'll have a potato or whatever else. It's really hard if you're trying to be 100% raw. Does it make that much of a difference? It depends. It depends on the state that people are in, right? I, you know, I just, I just don't think it's absolutely necessary for most people. You know, I, cause I, I mean, I'm always fascinated with the people that can do it because I, I was for a while, I went to living white, but I, I just, you know, in the cold, especially the ones that can do it in the colder climates, you know, yeah. hey, speaking of cold, like that has to do with hormonal health, doesn't it? When some people are more, you know, a lot of people like I'm always cold. I don't know. So 
Well, it could be your metabolic. It could be that you're you're thin and you don't have fat on your, you don't have a cushioning. Most <laughs> people have a lot more fat on their skin and that keeps them warm. Yeah, it could be a thyroid thing. And I would definitely, if somebody's um, unusually cold, then I would definitely check out thyroid. Unfortunately, the standard way of checking out thyroid is not complete. And so we look at a lot of other things to see. Um, I, I prefer warm. And I get irritated when I have to go out in the cold. I don't like it. I don't like going for a run in the cold. I'll go out for a run when it's 90 degrees, no problem. But don't make me go out when it's 50 degrees. I think that's too cold. Mm -hmm. So is there a hormonal basis? Could be. Um, and it just depends on the degree of intolerance to cold. That's so interesting because I remember I had a guest on the show, Dr. Melissa Sunderman. She goes, there's no such thing as bad weather, just inappropriate clothing. And I'm like, yeah, you know, no, there's bad weather. Bad weather, right? <laughs> My nose is going to get cold. I can't completely recover it up because I do have to breathe. That is so funny. Well, it's, I'm so sorry it's taken so long for us to meet because I do, I mean, I've known about you, you know, like I said, I heard you on summits. I, I believe you were on the uh, the Food Revolution Summit and other summits. Uh, and I think, weren't you on Dr. Rick Dina's summit? I could have sworn. Oh yeah, several times. Yeah. So yeah. I've heard you, but I've never met you. So I'm, it, was, it was delightful really to good. meet you. And, and thank you for the work you do. And thank you for being vegan and for helping people in this area. And everything will be below in the show notes if you guys want more information. And that cauliflower bagel recipe sounds amazing. I'm sure we get that to you. <laughs> yeah. Great. Thank, thank you, you for so much, me. Dr. Rita Marie. And thanks all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please come back tomorrow for another great show.